This is the continued reading of the book Prayer by M. L. Andreessen. We are in chapter 24, and this is the second portion of reading. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name is the first of the seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer. It concerns the reverence due his holy name. As God himself is holy, so is his name. We pray that we may hallow that holy name, hold it in reverence. In Old Testament times, a name generally mirrored some outstanding characteristic in the person named. Thus Jacob earned his name because of the unreliability of his character. He had difficulty telling the truth. After his experience with the angel, God changed his name from Jacob, a deceiver, to Israel, an overcomer. Mary, the mother of Jesus, before the birth of her son, was commanded, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. Jesus, Savior, was to be his name, for he should save his people. If God's name is to signify all that he is, it must be a special name, and it is. God himself chose it as the summation of all his attributes, an expression of his total being and eternal existence, the Almighty, the one which is and which was and which is to come. Revelation 1 verse 4. Moses had been chosen by God as leader of Israel. As such, it would be his work to go to Egypt, where Israel was in bondage, and persuade the king to let them go. He was also to gather Israel together and persuade them to go. Both of these missions were hard ones, and Moses hesitated to accept this work. He was unknown to the Israelites, having left Egypt forty years before, and he knew it would be a Herculean task to persuade a whole nation to leave all their property and start on a journey that would bring them into a barren desert. He felt that he must have divine credentials, or he could never succeed. So he said to God, When I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3, verse 13 and 14. In the next verse, God explains further, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Verse 15. This is indeed a strange name, but it is the name God himself chose. It is his name forever, and his memorial unto all generations. It denotes the ever-living one, the self-existing one, the one who always has been and always will be. The original Hebrew word is capital letters J-H-V-H. Hebrew was originally written without vowel sounds, and this name was probably pronounced Yahweh, from which we get the word Jehovah. The word Yahweh occurs thousands of times in the Old Testament and in the American Revised Version is always translated Jehovah, while the King James Version translates it Lord God, written in small capitals. When the reader finds Lord God in his authorized version, he may know that the original is Jehovah, God's self-chosen name, the I Am. This name was counted so sacred by the Jews that it was never pronounced by them. Not only did they not pronounce it, they were even forbidden to think it. When they came to it in their reading, publicly or privately, they substituted in its stead Adonai. The name Jehovah becomes of interest to us as we learn that commentators, in general, hold that Jehovah in the King James Version is the name of the second person of the Godhead, Christ. The I Am who told Moses that this was his name forever is the same who calmly told the Jews that he was the I Am, John 8, verse 58. It was Christ who from the bush on Mount Horeb spoke to Moses, saying, I am that I am. 
That was quoting from The Desire of Ages, page 24. When Christ, with solemn dignity, told the Jews, quote, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Silence fell upon the vast assembly. The name of God given to Moses to express the idea of the eternal presence had been claimed as his own by this Galilean rabbi. He had announced himself to be the self-existent one, he who had been promised to Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. End quote. That was from pages 469 and 470 of the book Desire of Ages. And from John 8, verse 59, we read, Then took they up stones to cast at him. This was not the only time that Christ claimed to be the I Am. One time, when the disciples saw Christ walking on the water, they cried out in fear, thinking they saw a spirit. Mark 6, verses 47 through 50. Christ calmed them by saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Verse 50. The Greek reads, Be of good cheer, I am. And the wind ceased. Verse 51. The name I am stands for the revealed character of God. This is made clear in God's answer to Moses' request that he be shown his glory. Exodus 33, verse 18. Said God, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Verse 19. Accordingly, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7. The Lord did not proclaim to Moses a name as such. He lets his goodness pass before him, and that was his name. He told Moses what he was, naming his attributes, his character, his inmost self, his complete personality. That is his name. In effect, God said, What I am, that is my name. And this he summed up in the Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah. I am that I am. Or as some translate, I am what I am. What God is, that is his name. Christ is the great I am that ever liveth, the Prince of life, Spirit of life. With him there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. That is why his name is I Am. When we think of the past, of the days of Abraham, there is the I Am. Or if we think of the future, the forever, there is the I Am also. He ever liveth. For another reason than that mentioned above, The name of God becomes of special interest to the church of God today. For as John looked, lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Revelation 14 verse 1 RSV This means that they had the character of God impressed upon them. This name is that which was revealed to Moses when God came down on Mount Sinai and let his goodness pass before him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Exodus 34, verses 4 through 7. In view of this, it may be profitable to look a little more closely at the attributes listed. For as far as these attributes are applicable to mankind, the 144,000 will possess them. This is a high honor and a high responsibility. In this first petition of the Lord's Prayer, we express our desire to keep holy and sacred the name of God. Strange that this name should be the one which the world most misuses and takes in vain. 
God's name is dragged in the filth and slime of obscene curses and oaths and is coupled with Satan's name in blasphemy. We cannot at all times shut ourselves out of hearing this, but we can be warned not to get so accustomed to hearing foul language that it ceases to shock us. As we are commanded to keep holy the Sabbath day, so we are admonished to hallow God's name, for holy and reverend is his name. Psalm 111 verse 9. When we become Christians, we are adopted as members of the family of God and take his name upon us. This name we are not to take in vain. We are not to profane it or bring it in ill repute. Most families are jealous of their reputation and their good name and guard it carefully from becoming identified with anything that is questionable. God also was jealous of his name and his family. We must not lower the standard which God has set for his people and which he has made possible of attainment by the abundant provision he has made for man to live above sin. But we wish to encourage those who find themselves coming short of their intentions or who have been taught that the goal is unattainable. Let such be of good cheer. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Proverbs 24, verse 16. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Micah 7, verse 8. God reckons as perfect those who may yet be far from the end of the race, but whose heart is perfect toward him, who are on the right road and facing in the right direction. They are struggling on, but appear to make little progress. God looks in pity upon them, and though they fall seven times, he will lift them up and cheer them on. It is not necessarily how far a man has come that counts, It is the direction in which he is going that matters. Hear these heartening words from Ellen G. White, Signs of the Time, June 16, 1890. When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service, and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merits. End quote. God admonishes his people to be holy. He told Abraham to be perfect. He calls Noah perfect. It is evident that the perfection or holiness which these men had or strove for was not the final perfection of God or of the saints in glory. It is possible for a thing or a person to be perfect and yet not perfected. The bud is perfect, says Isaiah. So is the seed, the newborn lamb, the acorn. These things are perfect in every state of development, but full perfection awaits the time of ripening. An apple from the time of the first bloom may be perfect, though it is yet green and unfit for food. When at last it is ripe, it is perfected. Paul informed us that he had not already attained. Either were already perfect, Philippians 3, verse 12. He had not reached the goal he had set for himself. But I press toward the mark, he said, verse 14. Then, having in mind those who with him were pressing forward, he said, Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, verse 15. In verse 15, by the use of the word us, He included himself in those who claim perfection. In these verses, Paul exemplified the biblical use of the word perfect. God counts those perfect who press on and are thus minded. If there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12. According to this principle, we are admonished to go on, quote, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 
2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. The man who is on the right road will at last be counted as having attained, even though he was yet far from perfection. The prayer, Hallowed be thy name, is a prayer of consecration, a prayer for purity and holiness. It is the first petition in the Lord's Prayer and thus gives holiness its rightful place. It calls upon men to dedicate themselves to God, to be jealous of His holy name as they become members of the family of God.